term that's been coined um, mostly by companies that are um, gearing up to sell solutions that address some of the big urban problems that we have around traffic, energy management, education, public safety. Um, and they've really kind of dominated the conversation for the last few years. Um, and the idea basically is to use information technology to make cities work better. Um, to put sensors out in the roads and in the power system so that we can see what's happening and manage them more carefully. Um, to use video surveillance to augment traditional police, policing methods. Um, to use simulations to not only see what's happening now but predict what might happen in the next 48 hours, say. And IBM just deployed a system in Rio de Janeiro that allows them to, to predict what the, what the weather's going to be in 48 hours um, very, very well. And why that's useful is because rain that falls on the, the steep hillsides where the squatter towns, the favelas are, um, creates mudslides and you know, destroys property and kills people and creates. And so they want to be able to tell those people to get out. And that's one vision of what a smart city is, a very kind of top-down, engineering-driven um, set of solutions that industry is providing. And IBM's not the only company. Siemens um, just reorganized about a quarter of its workforce into a cities and infrastructure division. Um, Cisco Systems, the, the networking company, is, is partnering a huge new town that's being built in Incheon in Korea called New Songdo City. And they want to put high definition video conferencing in every room, make it as ubiquitous as a dishwasher, turn it into a household appliance. Um, but there's also this really um, vibrant grassroots uh, innovation going on. That's, there's a lot of startups that are creating apps for s smartphones that help you navigate the city and use the city better. And if you look on your own phone, you'll probably find five, ten apps fi for finding restaurants, um, for, for um, you know, looking up ratings, for getting travel directions, for getting to the airport, that kind of stuff. And there's also a whole group of citizen hackers. Um, these are people who are, are, they're technologists. They may be entrepreneurs, they may not, um, who are interested in solving the problems of cities using technology. And we're sort of seeing that bubble up and, and really just a fascinating array of experiments um, that aren't about taking the systems we have and making them work a little better, which is what industry's doing, but I think about totally transforming the urban experience in a way that makes it more social and more transparent and more inclusive. I think um, in an ideal world, and the world that I'm trying to push us towards, um, this grassroots and, and industry can actually work in alignment and that government can play a key role in sort of plugging them into each other. Because what the grassroots provides is, is creativity, okay? New ideas, new ways of, of thinking about problems and thinking about solutions. And industry provides this incredible um, excellence, this ability to, to really engineer robust systems and to do it at a massive planetary scale. Um, some of the same companies that are, that are getting into the smart city business are the ones that built the infrastructure that we live with. I mean, you look in these walls around us, you'll find things made by IBM, Siemens, and GE, um, and even Cisco. And um, I think that it's up to city leaders, and I really say this broadly, city leaders, um, to you know, listen to what groups like the Pirates are saying, right? Um, and what they're demanding, and what their vision of the future is, and then look at the tools that industry can provide, and sort of, sort of try to chart a path um, you know, to a future that, that basically, you know, everybody wins and it incorporates all the views of all the stakeholders. What's happening right now is it's very much being driven only, I think, by, by industry's vision. And the pirates are sort of a radical response to that. Yeah. Um, and there's this, this possibility that we won't get into this future where, every, where everybody sort of is one happy family and we, we build systems that are, you know, both big and profitable, but also open and, and reflect democratic values or culture or whatever it is. And we might be headed for a battle over the smart city. And if you look back at what happened um, during the period of motorization in the 20th century, after World War II, when cars began to be introduced in great numbers into American cities um, and Western Europe as well, um, and you had companies like General Motors selling these visions of utopia that were all focused around their product. And the consequences of that have been devastating. Um, they've hollowed out our urban centers. They've wasted these beautiful tracts of land by building suburbs. They've put us in a very difficult position in terms of energy and having a very high energy society. And so, um, you know, and there were battles that, that were waged between people who were trying to prevent cars from coming into the city and freeways being rammed through the city. Uh, here in New York, we had a planner named Robert Moses who was sort of the, the planning czar 
who used to describe how he would put a highway through a neighborhood. He'd say, you have to hack your way through with a meat axe. Mm. Okay, like to imagine that someone would talk about, you know, destroying an urban community in that way today is, is horrifying. And it's horrifying because people responded to that injustice and they organized and they fought back. And so our understanding of cities today is very different than it was back then. I think we may be setting ourselves up for a similar kind of battle um, where we have industry coming in and, and painting this vision of a city that's organized around their technology and not listening to what's going on at this grassroots that has a very, very different vision yeah. and their goals are very different. I think, you know, if we can start having more conversations and sort of see that, that conflict emerging, um, have some good civic leaders who, and there are, there are leaders around the world um, who are, are seeing that and seeing the need to, to, to guide this investment and guide this energy that's coming from the citizenry. Well, but but it's going to take some time. And I think every city is going to come up with a different answer to it. And that's this notion of civic laboratories that I've been playing with, um, is that we're not going to see the same solution in every city. Like smart city, the answer to what is a smart city is going to be different. I don't think that there is any one smartest no. city. I think cities are so complex and, and different systems mm -hmm. in the city, in each city, are being upgraded um, with smart technologies at different rates. I think um, what's really fascinating is the speed with which good ideas are moving between cities. And this is something that 10 or 20 years ago, if one, one city came up with an innovation, it would take years or decades to spread through uh, conferences and diplomatic exchanges and people traveling and, and, mm. and sharing the ideas. Now, those things get out on the internet in very rich form in video and, and stories and the ideas get copied very quickly. And so uh, bike sharing, bus rapid transit, these are things that are, are being copied between cities now very, very quickly. I think we'll see the same with smart systems, and we are. Um, so in terms of, of uh, city governments sharing data and making data open and available to software developers, this is something that's happening in, in uh, public transit now very, very quickly. Um, from almost none three years ago to like 100 transit agencies now in the United States that are making data open for software developers so that they don't have to try and innovate, which they can't do. They're going to let the, the technology community innovate.